welcome back to uh, another day fully packed with talks and events. And we'll start with uh, Daniel Krashen continuing his lecture series. All right, uh, thank you. <coughs> so, um, you know, it's still a bit early in the morning. Um, I'm, I'm working on my coffee, and I'm, I'm guessing that it'll probably kick in about halfway through the lecture. So hopefully, you know, it might be slow, but we'll, we'll catch up after a little while. Um, so, um, so today, um, I wanted to kind of uh, narrow the focus a little bit. Where is the good chalk? Over here. Um, so last time, we talked about kind of an assortment of different um, kind of ways of measuring kind of uh, complexity of Galois cohomology. We talked about cohomological dimension, diophantine dimension. We talked about symbol length. We talked about these things. Today, I want to focus on one particular one that's been, I think, one of the um, kind of most you know, highlighted um, directions of inquiry in, in recent years, and that's the, um, the period index problem. So um, let me uh, just start by saying what, uh, let me just try to phrase the, frame this problem a little bit. Um, so, uh, so if, um, if alpha is an element of some Galois cohomology group, um, maybe this is like, um, let's just call it like something neutral like M, or no, yeah, M is fine, something like that. Maybe this is like, um, mu mu l to the tensor m, or maybe it's you know some something else, but just some element in Galois cohomology. We say that the index is the um, the GCD of the possible degrees of field extensions um, that make this thing zero. So in some sense, um, this is a little bit. Uh, unintuitive in some sense why this should kind of like measure complexity. It's kind of measuring how hard it is to kill a cohomology class, like how big an extension you need to go to. Um, there's a, uh, but let me, let me kind of frame that in, in general, it's like a little bit tricky to think of this as like a size of a cohomology class. Just saying how hard something is to kill isn't kind of saying kind of how big it is somehow. Um, but anyways, but it's some approximation in some sense. So, okay, this is the index and the period. I, I just mean the order in, the, in, in this group. So, um, because of the fact that, um, that uh, Galois cohomology has both these um, restriction and uh, co-restriction um, uh, uh, operations, it, it follows that uh, you can you can check, and so this is like an, an exercise for like just after the lecture, that you can show that the period always divides the index, and the index and the period um, have the same uh, prime divisors, and because they have the same prime divisors, that tells you that the index is also going to divide um, some power of the period. So you kind of think about the period as the kind of like obvious information about the cohomology class, and the index as a bit more subtle. And the period index problem uh, asks the question of, um, you know, given um, uh, a fixed, uh, you know, I guess, let me, let me say it like this. Um, the period index problem in general is what can we say about uh, the n in this exponent? How much bigger is it possible for the index to be than the period? Okay, so um, so let me try to uh, uh, frame this problem a little bit more carefully. So the the case of interest for us, we're going to imagine is some like twisted roots of unity because these are just the kinds of things that kind of uh, often come up. Uh, maybe I should say just as a matter of orientation and also to kind of query the wisdom of the audience, um, 
like, okay, so in, 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 in principle, you know, one might consider like these groups for arbitrary M and N and L and all that. But in practice, um, some of these come up in nature more often than others. So in fact, um, as I mentioned before, if you look at the case where M is equal to N, then this stuff is identified um, via Blockado. Norm residue isomorphism theorem, as we are supposed to say, uh, with the um, Milner K theory mod L. And so this is kind of like one very natural group that comes up, uh, the case where M is equal to N. Um, it's also true that in kind of like various circumstances, um, the twist kind of like one below naturally comes up. So for example, the torsion part of the Brouwer group is that for n equals two. You know, these are um, cyclic extensions for um, n equals one, whereas the one on top are the Coomer extensions. Uh, in terms of like uh, invariance naturally associated with algebraic objects, things that arise in the theory of cohomological invariance, this is typically the kind of repository of interesting information. Yeah? So like, I'm not, I'm not sure, why is that true, by the way? Why is it like these two twists that keep coming up all the time? What do you mean by H1, though? I'm, I'm kind of confused. Exactly, right? So, like, <laughs> okay, so uh, let, me, let me translate. Uh, so this is what I hear when you say that. What I, what I hear is, like, this is the natural one, yeah. and this is, the, this is the error term. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay. So that, but okay, I mean, okay, but I don't know. But on the other hand, like, I, I mean, I don't know. Like Anne, Nikita, I mean, I, does that, that doesn't, I don't think that sounds natural from our perspective, right? Is that the error term? That's like the interesting part. Yeah. Yes, that's true, that's true, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, okay, okay, no, I, 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 I think that's, I think that's totally valid, I think that's totally valid, yeah. <laughs> right, right, right. But it's some, but it's some, I guess, some moral reason from some perspective why it comes up, right, I mean, why it should naturally come up. Okay, anyway, sorry, I just, I was just curious about that, because it always bugs me, and I figured I would ask people, so it bug, would bug them too. Okay, um, so in practice, these are the, these are the things that, that come up. Um, let me make this um, absolutely horrible definition. So um, for a field F, we're gonna call the splitting dimension at L with respect to N and M of F, okay, to be um, the the smallest um, n such that um, the, um, the index of a class divides the period of the class to the n for al alpha and hn f mu l tensor m. Okay, so this is, uh, this is the, the splitting dimension. Okay. Um, now, this splitting dimension uh, doesn't necessarily have like a lot of uh, nice properties that we would want. It's a little bit useful um, to not just consider cohomology classes over the original field, but also over finite extensions. So um, we can kind of add a letter and call this the stable splitting dimension. Uh, to be the largest value of the splitting dimension uh, in 
m of, let's say, e, where e over f is finite. So the period index question asks about um, how big these kinds of numbers can be. And it's one way to, to, uh, to, to say, oh, so, so period index problem is to bound um, like this SD MNLF or the SSD um, via, um, I don't know, uh, some notion of the dimension of the field. Um, so we want to know, like, what's the worst possible thing that can happen? So, like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, um, okay, so we can kind of make a couple of simplifications um, right, right off the bat. Um, basically, uh, by, like, Chinese remainder theorem, um, you can just check that the stable splitting dimension, let's say L in M F, um, is no more. Uh, so let's see, this is no more than the maximum of the stable splitting dimension in M P F, where P divides L is a prime. So uh, you can't do this with SD, but with SSD you can do this, so it's a little bit nicer. So we can, you can actually reduce to the case where you know, you're only looking at one prime at a time. Um, and maybe um, it's also useful to just say um, SSD kind of full stop maybe is like the worst that happens for any L, you know. So, you know, okay, which is then, you know, really just the same as the maximum over primes. Okay, so now, um, let, let me now tell you, um, oh, oh, I'm sorry, there's, there's another, and there's another uh, thing that's, that we could mention, which is that uh, you can also show that SSD um, P and M of f um, doesn't depend on m. So once you're down to a prime, basically throwing in like roots of unity and kind of getting rid of that twist doesn't, doesn't hurt you. So from that perspective, we might as well talk about like SSD upper np of f, or if we were doing a maximum, we could just talk about SSD n of f is the maximum of those. Okay, so um, anyways, the proof of all these things is uh, an exercise. <laughs> like, you know, literally, if you, if you stay too long, right? Okay. <laughs> so, um, okay, so what do we know about these, about these numbers? So, so again, this is, um, this is some way of kind of bounding the complexity of a, of a cohomology class. Uh, yeah, so what do, what, do we, what do we know about these? So let me give you like a really like stupid thing, um, which is like H1 in equals one, SSD um, in H1. So this is how big, you know, how hard is it to like, you know, uh, to split something like this or to split something like um, Z mod L. Well, what is the, these are like cyclic extensions and Coomer extensions. How hard is it to split them? Well, you just go to a, that cyclic or Coomer extension and you've done it. So that means the, these things have maybe period, if this is like a P, period P, and you can do it with a degree P extension. So that means this um, splitting the, um, 
uh, this is uh, one. You know, it's the period and index are kind of equal. Okay. Uh, as long as, um, you know, if f is not, uh, if f like has actually some cyclic extensions, you know, not algebraically closed or something like that, uh, not separably closed. So unless you're in some crazy situation, it's just one. Um, SSD2 of f. Well, so now we're talking about um, H2. And we might as well be talking about um, mu l, because the kind of twist uh, kind of doesn't matter in, in some sense you know, when we're with these, with these bounds. So we're talking about the, the Brouwer group for two, at least so this would be the L torsion, for example. And so as one example, this is going to be um, zero if f is finite, because Wedderburn's theorem says that there aren't any finite division algebras. Um, and kind of famously, this is going to be one if f is global. So it's known for global fields that, uh, that uh, you can always uh, split uh, a division algebra with an extension that's the same as its period. Or um, periodic as well. Okay. And um, Now, the, the kind of next bit of uh, kind of uh, interesting information here was um, Mike Arden showed. Um, this was back in 1981. That, um, that if you have a Brouwer class whose period is either uh, two or three, and where f is the function field of an algebraic surface, then the period is equal to the index. So this was like a really kind of like interesting, somewhat ad hoc geometric argument uh, that, that he made. And he then conjectured, kind of natural to conjecture, um, that maybe these guys um, for such a field, um, oh, you always have period equal to index. Um, so this was kind of, uh, there wasn't really much, uh, I'm trying to think of the most, I'm sorry, I'm still a little bit tired. I'm trying to think of the most dramatic way of like saying this, but I'm like, I feel like there's like no drama here right now. It's all very exciting, but like, let me have a little more coffee. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Um, so like, you know, okay. So like, I, I started grad school like, you know, back in like the mid '90s and stuff like that, and in at that point. Nobody was really talking about the period index problem because like this is about every the, all that anybody knew. So it was like, why phrase this as a problem? It was like, we had a couple of cases where we knew how to say something about the index, but it wasn't like it, it wasn't like the period index problem. There was there was there was too little data to actually like make it really that big a thing, I guess. Um, Probably if you'd said period index, people would have thought you were talking about like, um, like genus one curves or something like that, because there was like a lot of period index action over there historically. But like, um, but I guess um, you know towards, uh, you know, uh, at some point when I was in grad school, like 1997, um, my advisor proved Saltman proved that if you looked at you didn't really phrase it exactly like this, but SSD um, two, so bounding the 
index of a Brouwer class um, for, I mean, ba basically nothing was known, like no interesting results were known outside of these cases, right? So uh, he was able to show that this thing um, was two. So in other words, you, you, you're looking at a piatic curve, you add an indeterminate, um, and it goes up by one. I mean, it's kind of, I guess, natural. Like, also, another thing for finite, I, uh, that, sorry, that zero is the case of, um, of a function field in one variable that's probably worth mentioning. So, um, so you can kind of see like this very small pattern, like going from like a finite field to like a global field, it went up by one. Going from like C of X to like a surface, we believe it goes up from zero to one. <laughs> going from a piatic field to a curve over a piatic field, it went up by one. There's kind of this hope maybe that you're, it's gonna go up by one when you add a transcendental element or something like that. Okay, but it was uh, eventually, uh, Saltman was able to prove this. And, um, and then a short while later, there was this you know, dramatic result of, um, of de Young. Um, oh, I guess right before that, there, uh, Koya Tolan formulated this uh, he kind of as a question. Um, um, so this was, um, I think, around 2001, maybe. Um, he said, well, based on this very little evidence, but uh, maybe SSD for a function field should be the dimension of x um, minus 1. In fact, it's not so crazy to, to, to posit something like that, because on the one hand, you can at least try to write down clauses and see how bad they can look, how big of an index you can construct. And what you can show is that you can come up with classes in H2 that have index that's this big, right? So, you know, so for a surface, you can certainly come up with things with period equals index. On a threefold, you can write down things where the index is the square of the period, et cetera. The real question is, can you, do, how do you know that that's like the best you can do, that things don't get worse than that, right? So just based on the fact that we have evidence that you can get this bad and no worse that w anybody can construct, he formulated this question, which kind of put a little more context into that. Um, and then the, um, this question of Artin was then proved in 2002 by de Young. Uh, so he showed that SSD2 of a complex surface uh, was actually one. The interesting thing about this, and I'll, I'll maybe say a bit uh, towards the end, I, I mean, oh, I should have like given like an outline or something like that. Okay, so here's what I'm gonna do today. <laughs> okay, so um, what, I, I, what I wanna do is take kind of like a, a survey of like kind of the kinds of things that we know so far about period index for the Brouwer group. Um, I want to give a, just a, an overview of the kinds of methods that have gone into it, because they've come from a lot of different places. Um, and then I'll focus on like one method at the end, start to introduce it, because it's just like the one I know best, and then talk mostly about that and applying it to higher cohomology next time. So, um, so you know, maybe I'll say more about this later. But the but these are very different methods. So Saltman's proof is basically um, by um, by looking at um, I guess the um, the difference between. Uh, so okay, so. Do I, how much do I want to talk about this now? Um, okay, right, right, well, yeah. So on the one hand, you can look at the, um, the H2 of, of something like this. So th this is like, you know, this is some like curve uh, function field 
of a curve over, over this periodic field. Um, but you can think of it as the, you know, the function field of some model, let's say over like ZP or something like that. And so there's a question of like, um, what's, what's the difference between looking at, let's say, the etal cohomology of this model and the Galois cohomology of the function field, which is also the etal cohomology of the function field, right? Um, Saltman's proof um, basically studies this by looking at the obstructions for classes coming from here, the so-called ramification, which is like, if you have a class here, what kind of tells you what prevents it from coming from here? In the case of QP, you can show that this map actually turns out to be the zero map, and so it's kind of like there's kind of not much going on over here, actually. But in contrast, in, in the de Jong situation, you know, you have the function field of the surface and then the cohomology of the surface. He reduces to the case where it comes entirely from the cohomology of the surface and, you, and uses geometric mapping. So in some sense, like, these are very, like, kind of perpendicular approaches. Um, okay. Okay. Um, the next kind of uh, chronological target um, is, uh, involves these things which we now call... Um, semi-global fields. And like, don't ask me why they're called semi-global fields. Just, I, I was there at the time, but don't ask me. Okay. <laughs> okay, so um, a semi-global field really is just a field of the form, uh, let's say, k of x, function field where x over k is a curve, and k is a um, complete uh, discretely valued field. So it's just, it's just some, some animal like that. Very, very general, really. Um, these are uh, the, the kind of, uh, kind of uh, motivating example is something like this. And the idea being that you want to um, say, let's say maybe like little k is the residue field. You'd like to say that if you know something about um, the residue field and curves of the residue field, then you can infer something about fields like this. Um, so let's see. So the, the results of this sort, um, so this is a result of um, Harbader, um, Hartman, and myself in, um, in 2009, but also um, by uh, Lieblich in 2011, although these were basically at the same time, it's just like when the, the stuff got published. Um, so kind of simultaneously, essentially and independently, uh, this, uh, for a field like this, um, this is shown to be bounded by uh, the uh, stable splitting dimension of the residue field plus two and the stable splitting dimension of curve over the residue field plus one. So, you know, the, the idea, um, so l l maybe I should just say, like, this is, a, this is an extremely awkward field you know, because like uh, QP doesn't have like finite like Diophantine dimension or anything like that. So it's, um, uh, and so QP of X, you know, there's, it, you know, it also doesn't have like a well, this dimension is not as well behaved as you would like. On the other hand, if you look at the residue field, if you look at like, FP, that's great. Curves over FP, that's easy. These are C2 fields. These are kind of easy to, to think about. And we know how to do, this even a global field, we even understand period index over this field. So it's, it's very strange that on the one hand, going from FP to QP doesn't give problems. Going from FP to FP of uh, T or of X or whatever doesn't give problems. 
but kind of going to QP of t uh, turns out to be you know, very, like, much more subtle. In, in general, you would want to know that kind of adjoining an indeterminate kind of makes everything go up by one, but it seems there's really no tools for, uh, for getting a good handhold on that. Um, okay. So um, I would say still the, the kind of holy grail um, in, this, in this subject uh, is to understand the stable splitting dimension of Q of X. You know, if, if you think about like, um, you know, Brouwer classes that are like the most mysterious and interesting that come up in nature, you know, like, I don't know, if you're trying to like, um, if you're trying to get somebody like interested in like a conversation, you know, in a math department, right, you should like say something like, Tate Shafarevich group, right? And that, that like maybe people are like, oh yes, non-trivial, subtle, interesting, right? And so, um, so, <laughs> so it, it turns out, you know, that you know that that the Tate-Shafarevich group is in some sense controlled by the the Brouwer group of a model of a curve over a number field. So, like. When you're asking about how well do you understand kind of like the bad behavior of like Brouwer classes over curves over number fields, the
Okay, yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. You guys haven't heard anything, have you? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay, anyways. Um, oh, but I do feel like I don't have to talk as loud now. That's interesting. Okay. Here's my conjecture. Stable splitting dimension is bounded by um, the dimension of f minus 1. If, if it happens to have like finite Diophanton dimension, that would be this, but you know. Um, uh, choose n minus 1. So, um, so my, my, so in particular, you know, if n equals two, it should just go up by one each time linearly. But for n equals three, it should go up quadratically. So um, my justification for this conjecture, this is the reason that I, um, that I don't really want to blame anybody else for it. I had this like kind of like, kind of like, numerology reason for for this, and it was based on some like examples that I thought like, you know, sh surely nobody can split this quadratic form with an extension that's smaller than blah, 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 or whatever, you know, and I, I explained this to my student, um, Saurabh Gassavi at the time, who then came in the next week and said, oh, actually, I can split it with smaller extensions, you know. So basically, like, the, my justification for this conjecture, like, I now no, have no justification for this conjecture, you know, like, it was based on some examples that I did wrong. <laughs> but, um, but, what, uh, but what I'll sh uh, maybe try to show next time is that there's, uh, we did, there are a series of interesting examples for n equals 3, kind of non-trivial, where these bounds look like they're, where we can at least prove these kinds of bounds for H3 and these kind of quadratic growth. Uh, that was the original motivating examples was based on kind of quadratic forms and the and H and yeah uh, just kind of um, you know higher invariance of quadratic forms and how to split them and stuff like that. Um, the examples that I'll talk about though are not from quadratic forms; they're just uh, H3 classes for, and, and other situations. Um, anyway, so I wanted to just put that out there um, because you know. So the, you know, so somehow the expectation is that you know the cohomology should start out really simple in the bottom, get explosively complicated in the middle, and then when you get close to the actual kind of top dimension, it gets simple again. Right. All right. So um, what I'm going to do now for, I guess I have 15 minutes, right? Until 9.30? Yeah? Okay. I, I'm just going to give like a brief overview of some of the methods. And I'm going to focus now mostly on the methods that I'm not going to talk about tomorrow. So, um, so the, the first method, um, the one that um, uh, Saltman used is uh, ramification. It, it goes... The idea is something like this. If, if x is um, some regular, I don't know, integral uh, scheme, um, and let me just, you know, so all this stuff you can kind of do analogous things in kind of bad characteristic, but I'm talking about Galois cohomology and not the kind of like, um, I don't know, Duram Vit kind of analog stuff. Um, so, but, but there is such things. I'm just not talking about them. Um, so I'm going to assume that, uh, that L is some invertible um, guy. Um, and in that case, what do we have? We have this um, complex. Um, so this just means like a function field of x. And you know, the coefficients are, I don't know, um, in some, I, I mean, I guess I could call it you know, mu L to the tensor M or one of these kinds of things. Um, there's a, what you, some people call residue, others call ramification map that goes to the sum over um, the codimension one points of the n minus first cohomology of the residue fields at the points 
Now you're twisted um, one last time, minus 1. And this uh, comes from the uh, global etal cohomology. OK. Um, this doesn't have to be exact, but it's at least a complex, which is, um, which is exact in various particular circumstances in certain situations. You think about it as like, so I mean, you know, there's a few ways of kind of like thinking about this, about like kind of what's going on over here, which is kind of like a, a Gersten flavor thing, is the, this is kind of like the E1 page of a spectral sequence that's computing this stuff. And so this is kind of like the first problem that you might have coming from global things. And then there's kind of like further problems down there. But this is kind of like the first approximation of your problems. Um, so, um, but in, in various cases, like, this is all you have to look at, so to speak, right? So, for example, um, so if, uh, if x over, if you have x over k um, dimension d, um, k finite, and n is d plus 1, then this is exact. Um, so this is a um, this was kind of like a conjecture of Cato that he proved for n equals three, um, and it was uh, eventually uh, proved by um, Kurtz and Saito, um, 2011 or so. Yeah. Um, so that's like a very kind of nice uh, case that we know this is true. We know if n equals two, if you're looking at the H2 stuff. Um, and if you have, um, like, for example, x over k uh, variety over some field, then it's going to be exact. Um, and um, and then there are various other cases where we um, where we know it's exact. I, you know, the uh, we expect that it's exact. For um, for x spec r, where r is um, is local, regular local ring, I think. Do we expect that? I think we sh probably do. Well, if if it's if it's over a field, we know that it's true there. But I don't know. I mean, in general, I guess. Okay, that's the conjecture. Okay, yeah. So. Um, no, right, that's exact. That is actually literally the conjecture. Okay, yes. <laughs> Thank you. That's right. That is what we call Gersten's conjecture in this block August world. Okay, yeah. <sighs> Almost. Okay, so, um, so because it's exact for n equals 2, um, what that means is that um, if you want to study these Brouwer classes, for example, over this function field, um, then it comes down to kind of two factors, understanding the, um, the actual etal cohomology and understanding this ramification map. And this ramification map is very explicit and computable in many circumstances. Um, and so essentially Saltman's method, as I alluded to, which is the case where x is some model of your of a curve over ZP um, is comes from the observation by Grothendieck that this is the zero map in that case, and so it's all about ramification, and you can actually compute the ramification. And so Solomon's method is you find some cover where when you kind of lift everything to that cover, all these ramification maps vanish, and then the Grothendieck stuff says there's nothing else happening. And then so that that cover is your splitting. It's a, you know, not a real cover cover. It's like a branched cover or something like that. But. OK. Um, the next uh, method uh, is twisted sheaves, which really um, has been kind of spearheaded and developed by, uh, by Max Liebling. Um The idea here. Um, 
what I'll just kind of say this very briefly because I want to say about one other thing afterwards. Somebody gives you a Brouwer class on some scheme X, and associated with that Brouwer class, you can build um, an algebraic stack with a little extra structure called a, 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 a gerb. So this is a this is a gerb, um, kind of a relative gerb, which you know you can either, depending on kind of how you play your game, maybe this is a um, a mu l gerb or something like that. But the real point here is that um, whatever this this thing is, it's you know it's a it's a very well behaved algebraic stack. It's a Deline Mumford stack. You can do all the you know all the things that you want to do um, uh, with it, and in, and in particular the the observ the uh, let's see so in particular on x alpha so on x alpha um, there are certain um, distinguished um, uh, sheaves uh, coherent sheaves which are called uh, twisted um, they behave you know they kind of form kind of like moduli when you fix invariance and stuff like that and these spaces behave just uh, analogously to um, looking at, let's say, moduli of, of, uh, of sheaves on X. So they're kind of like a, just a twisted version of the sheaves on X in some sense. And, um, and the observation uh, that, uh, that one makes is that, um, is that there exists a, um, let's say, uh, a coherent, or in various cases you can even say locally free, um, sheaf of a um, uh, twisted sheaf of rank, um, uh, or no, uh, n, if and only if um, the index of alpha divides n. So these twisted sheaves kind of give you a different way of getting at the index. It's kind of, it's a little bit of a story to say like why that should calculate an index. But in, in fact, the index turns out to be the GCD of the possible degrees of locally free sheaves on X. If you're regular, it's the GCD. Um, and, um, and so in particular, um, you can, you know, to how do you kind of prove that you have a certain index? You are just constructing a, one of these twisted sheaves. That's the way we approach this problem there. That's how Max kind of did a lot of his methods. And you, you so, um, Kind of one, my, one of my famous, one of my favorite um, examples of, of this is like, um, you know, Max in his thesis gave a, a nice, really like streamlined proof of de Young's theorem for surfaces using Graeber Harris star um, to basically think of it as like finding points on varieties. And you, so, what, like, the I, okay, um, no, uh, uh, we can talk about that later. I'm not going to finish if I. It's really cool stuff. But anyways, okay. Some other uh, other methods just to mention, um, like if if um, if you happen to have uh, like a variety that has like a nice source of covers, like if you have an abelian variety or something like that, or uh, then you know making like building isogenies is a you know you can generally analyze the effect of pulling back over isogenies on Brouwer classes, and that's a way of like kind of uh, constructing a nice um, particular, so if x is like the function field of something, uh, sorry, if, if, sorry, if f is like the function field of some x, and you have some nice isogeny over here, that'll give you a nice splitting field, potentially, if you can kind of like understand how Brouwer classes behave under these isogenies. And for abelian varieties, like you can kind of get naive bounds relatively quickly, although getting the correct bounds is a lot more subtle. Um, and therefore, kind of like reducing things to curves, um, and um, and their Jacobians, and using those isogenies also gives you bounds of, of various sorts. Although these bounds kind of like depend on the variety instead of just the dimension of the variety, which is like an awkward feature of them. Um, and I should I, I'd be remiss if I didn't kind of also mention that there have been some really um, like fascinating uses of Hodge theory to calculate index recently, or to get index bounds, um, by um, like um, uh, Hodgkiss, Alex Perry, Johan de Jong, 
uh, recently, and uh, this this basically involves um, trying to um, you know uh, so you you basically use um, Hodge theory to construct some kind of nice correspondences um, between like a variety that you start with and like and maybe a surface a surface inside where this kind of you have some kind of correspondence that has some some boundedness to it that says that all the Brouwer classes are actually coming from this surface, just being pushed in by this correspondence in some bounded way. And then you can kind of reduce the period index on your surface with kind of a various multiplicity of the correspondence in some sense. And like kind of how do you construct these correspondences and these cycles that they, you know, that's kind of the Hodge theory input. Okay. Anyways, that's really cool. So what am I, actually going to talk about next time, though, the, the kind of final thing is um, what you might say kind of like local global or kind of like fake local global. I mean, I guess so. Um, so I find like kind of local global principles as they occur, say, in number theory is very spooky and kind of like uh, you never quite I never quite really understand why they work. Right. I mean, like, in some sense, like, you're, you know, somebody gives you, like, Q, and you look at all these QPs, okay? Like, kind of think about it, like, geometrically, right? Q, the function field of your, like, line here, right? And then what are you looking at? You're looking at, like, these little infinitesimal neighborhoods of all these points. And, like, why should they, like, fill up the, I mean, they don't, they don't fit together. They don't overlap. There is, like, very discrete information, right? The idea that you should be able to tie these things together and get something global is really weird, right? I mean, it's, it is, to me, it's really weird. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about, uh, the, the, so the principles that I'll mention tomorrow actually give you such local principles in different contexts, but morally they're coming from, um, from something that feels a little more like, um, like, like kind of like, uh, I don't know, legitimate like local, like kind of like just a, of like a cover of a space, right? So like one would want to be able to like, um, yeah, so the, so the analogy, I'll just, I'm, I'm gonna, oh, okay. My talk just ended. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, let me just finish my sentence. Okay, so uh, I'm just gonna uh, kind of live live with this with this thought, which is like, um, you know, um, working with um, working with fields is really difficult to justify in terms of local global. Like, kind of the traditional like, let's say, computing like the class group or something with adelic stuff. You have like your Q, and then you have like your QPs. You know, you, you know, and or your ZPs, your ZPs, and you have your Q, and the Q is like the glue that like sticks the ZPs together, and so that actually makes sense, right? But if you wanted to like use that thought process to do to like glue together to get Q, that's just weird, right? Because you you've erased your glue, <laughs> right? On the other hand, in the kind of analytic setting. Like, even though, like, you can't use, like, Zariski local to, like, study a field because every Zariski patch has the same function field. But, uh, meromorph but kind of meromorphic functions do kind of help you, right? Like, they, you know, they actually are different and kind of global meromorphic, if you're, you know, in the Gaga sense, really are algebraic global functions. So like the idea of what I'm going to describe next time is a way of doing something that feels like this meromorphic patching or is meant to, um, but for attacking kind of fields that are more like uh, QPX. So we want to kind of morally use some sort of like piatic, you know, topology to do something like meromorphic functions. It's, you know, it kind of feels kind of attic-y but it's like it's really like a poor man's attitude. Like you don't actually, like it. It just it's much more naive, and it just kind of works. Okay. Well, that's enough. Okay. <laughs>